Hurricane Florence is being called a monster tonight, and it's still hundreds of miles off the Carolinas coast. As of this evening, the storm is 500 miles wide with winds at 140 miles an hour, a Category 4, and there are forecasts of two and a half feet of rain. PJ Tobia reports from Wilmington, North Carolina, where they're bracing for the worst. The beaches are still calm, but the danger is growing out at sea. For many around Wilmington, near Florence's direct path, the name of the game is elevation and triage. So at this point in the game, you're just trying to elevate things and get them at least this high or above. So you got to look at everything. Is that 50%? Like I need that for, you know, if I lost it, would I die? Or, you know, would I, is it irreplaceable, so to speak? People here are used to storms, but Florence could be the strongest to hit North Carolina since 1954. We've never had a hurricane like this that's come to Wrightsville Beach. Uh, and there's been threes and twos, but never anything this strong. So uh, we're going to be safe. The hurricane is on a path to make landfall in southeastern North Carolina Friday. Today, Governor Roy Cooper ordered evacuations of all the state's barrier islands. This storm is a monster. It's big and it's vicious. It is an extremely dangerous, life-threatening, historic hurricane. Even if you've ridden out storms before, this one is different. Don't bet your life on riding out a monster. In South Carolina, mandatory evacuations began at midday for the entire coast, affecting one million people. This one looks a little uglier than other ones. Um, rather be safe than sorry. The mass evacuation is a mammoth undertaking. But Governor Henry McMaster says it's the only choice. We are in a, a very deadly and important game of chess with Hurricane Florence. And what we are doing, Team South Carolina doing, is doing is staying one step ahead. Meanwhile, supplies at grocery and hardware stores are already dwindling as people stock up. And in places like Charleston, South Carolina, residents are readying sandbags for heavy flooding while food banks are packing non-perishables for potential power outages. The immense size of Hurricane Florence and up to 30 inches of rain mean the power losses and flooding will be felt over several states. Officials from the Federal Emergency Management Agency warn today the effects will not soon fade away. This storm is going to be a direct hit uh, onto our coast, uh, and, and I want to set the, the expectations now. Uh, that it is going to be a long time and a long-term recovery when we, when we uh, talk about the, the effects of Florence. So this is not going to be a storm that we recover from uh, in days. It will take us uh, uh, a good amount of time to, to, uh, to do the full recovery. President Trump has now declared states of emergency in the Carolinas and Virginia in anticipation of heavy damage and flooding. And P.J. Tobia joins me now. Um, P.J., I understand you are now on Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, about 50, 60 miles from the South Carolina border. That storm is coming in right from behind you, the ocean that we can see there. Can you just give us a sense, how are officials responding? Absolutely. Local officials that we spoke with today are very concerned about the impact of what they say could be a catastrophic storm coming their way. One city manager told us that in 20 years of government service, working in communities up and down the Carolina coast, he's never seen a storm of this size or of this strength. And so they're also taking remarkable steps in terms of preparation. A uh, voluntary evacuation order was uh, sent out this weekend. That becomes mandatory tomorrow night at 8 p.m. In the interim, all EMS, police, and fire personnel, as well as their vehicles, are being moved off of this barrier island and to the mainland right over there. Um, that's very unusual. So is your sense, is the sense that they're getting that the storm surge is just going to be so intense that it's going to scrape that island clean? That's exactly, that's exactly what their worst fears are, yes. And they say after 8 p.m. tomorrow, after that time, once the winds start blowing above 50 miles an hour, you'd better be someplace safe because the police and fire rescue are not going to be able to come help you. How about the people who live there? Are they, I know the, the mandatory evacuation isn't coming yet, but from people you've spoken with, are they going to heed that warning? Are they going to leave? Absolutely. I mean, this is a beach town, right? There's kind of a laid back vibe. Earlier this morning, there were some surfers in the waves behind me, uh, some cafes, and even bars were open this afternoon. But everyone we spoke with was deadly serious about getting off this island by the curfew tomorrow. We spoke to folks who had lived here for decades, who'd never boarded up their homes before, but said they were worried that this was the big one and they wanted to get a move on. Um, Earlier today, I met an 82-year-old woman 
who had been through the last Category 4 hurricane to come through here, Hazel, in the 1950s. She told me of destruction like she'd never seen before and that there were boats piled up in her backyard. She was just back here visiting with her daughter for the week. They cut their vacation short. They're headed back to Atlanta. All right, PJ Tobia, thanks so much. Now, let's focus some more on the strength of this storm and the worries over possible flooding from its rainfall. Ken Graham is the director of the National Hurricane Center. I spoke with him a short time ago from the center's headquarters in Miami. Ken Graham, thank you for being here. I know you've recently updated the forecast for this storm. Can you just give our viewers a sense of how massive Hurricane Florence is right now? You know, sometimes we run through those numbers and it's really tough to tell exactly how big. So I, I think the best way to do that is really coming over here to the satellite. And you draw a circle around what we have, Hurricane Florence. And you draw kind of an equal circle over the southeastern United States. You can see it covers states. I mean, this is a very large storm and the impact's well outside the center of it. So, you know, we got to be thinking outside this path. We got to be thinking much wider than that when it comes to those impacts. And right now, though, that path as currently projected takes the storm directly into South Carolina. Is that still correct? Yeah, that is still correct. And, you know, if you look at the two thirds of the time, we expect the center to be within this cone. So some uncertainty once it makes it uh, inland. But at the same time, you know, that's where we got, uh, you know, really making a, an eye on the hurricane warnings here in the Carolinas from South Carolina up to, to North Carolina. And that's where we think the highest chances of those hurricane force winds, basically the warning meeting that could occur in the next 36 hours. And what is your sense of the, the size of the storm surge residents there could be facing? Yeah, that's going to be a significant issue. You know, we have 50% of the fatalities in these tropical systems is the storm surge. So we spend a lot of time talking about the water. So we do have a storm surge warning for portions of South Carolina up through North Carolina. Any one of those areas could see greater than three foot uh, of storm surge. But when you really narrow it down, you start looking into the, the details you start to surface some of these higher values where it's not just these barrier islands. You get water surfacing over those barrier islands and it really tracks into these areas. I mean, this is an area that we're particularly concerned with. Uh, you know, looking at the Pamlico Sound, the Pamlico River, onto the Noose River, these areas where they normally the water flows out, storm surge can push that water in and where that water gets piled up, we are looking at some of those values getting to 10 to 13 feet. So a staggering amount of storm surge, very life-threatening, and that's something we, we definitely are focusing on. Separate from the potential impacts on the coast, I know the projections are that this storm could move inland and then stall, which could dump, I, I take it, historic amounts of rain. Is that still your forecast? It is. I'm actually we got a brand new map um, really just uh, just created. We just got this from our weather prediction center. Look at some of these values. If you really take this in, I mean, 20 inches of rain possible in this circle, even outside of it, 15 to 20 inches of rainfall, not just along the coast. It's really important for everyone to realize not just coastal, but look at this 10 to 15, even 15 to 20 well inland in Virginia and North Carolina. So this isn't just a coastal issue with the rainfall. You can have high you know, a lot of rainfall totals, uh, Maryland and, and Delaware. And if you talk about the terrain in some of these areas, with well, these rainfall totals with the terrain, dangerous uh, catastrophic fl uh, flash flooding potentially in some of these areas. So that's why we spend so much time talking about the rainfall, because the flash flooding uh, could lead to, to fatalities, and we, we need to be prepared for that. Is there anything that potentially in the forecast that could change whether or not the storm does, in fact, stall uh, once it's come inland? You know, I think at this point, really what we got to focus on are, are those impacts because, you know, we, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, different sides of the cone and where, where the system could go. The bottom line is this, this is a major hurricane. We're talking about uh, incredible winds and a large size. So no, no matter where we make landfall along the coast here, you're still going to have those impacts because either way it's going to stall out. So think about that. All the rain, the storm surge, and the other factor here, still a tropical storm over North Carolina, and that's on, on Saturday. And then by Sunday, still a depression in portions of even in uh, western North Carolina. That means saturated soil with that kind of wind, you're going to knock down a lot of trees and have significant power outages, some lasting quite a long time. I know you've been doing this for a long time. How does this, when you look historically, how does this storm compare as far as impacts on the, on the East Coast? 
You know, we've seen storms like this before, and it, and it is going to be historic. I mean, the impacts are going to be significant. And in really what we try to get, get the word out is not to compare those storms. Every one of them are so different. It's interesting when we start looking at history, somebody might say, well, it didn't happen to me then, and it could this time. So we try not to compare those storms because people start linking that to the category. The bottom line is that's why we spend so much time here at the Hurricane Center talking about the impacts, the rainfall and the storm surge and, and the wind. So, yeah, pretty historic and, and really looking at a very dangerous, catastrophic situation. Situation. So preparedness is absolutely everything. All right. Ken Graham of the National Hurricane Center, thanks very much. You bet. This afternoon, President Trump said the federal government is ready and totally prepared to deal with the hurricane. In his remarks, the president also called the federal response to Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, quote, incredibly successful. But the administration's response there has been heavily criticized from many quarters. The Puerto Rican government's official death toll from that storm and its aftermath is now estimated to be as high as nearly 3,000 people. A congressional watchdog said FEMA was overwhelmed by last year's hurricane season and did not deploy enough personnel to Puerto Rico.